After Dr. Dean Ornish conquered our number one killer, he moved on to killer number two. What happens if you put cancer on a plant-based diet? Ornish and colleagues found that the progression of prostate cancer could be reversed with a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors, and no wonder. If you dip the blood of those eating the standard American diet onto cancer cells growing in a petri dish, cancer growth is cut down about 9%. Put people on a plant-based diet for a year, though, and their blood can do this. The blood circulating within the bodies of those eating plant-based had nearly eight times the stopping power when it came to cancer cell growth. Now, this was for prostate cancer, leading cancer killer specific to men. In women, it's breast cancer, number one cancer killer of young women. So researchers wanted to repeat the study with women using breast cancer cells instead, but they didn't want to wait a whole year to get the results. Women are dying now, so they figured, well, let's see what a plant-based diet can do after just two weeks against three different types of human breast cancer. Cancer growth started out powering away at 100%, and then dropped after eating a plant-based diet for 14 days. Here's the before picture. A layer of breast cancer cells is laid down in a petri dish, and then blood from women eating the standard American diet is dripped on them. And as you can see, even the blood of women eating pretty poor diets has some ability to break down cancer. But after just two weeks eating healthy, Blood was drawn from those same women, so they acted as their own control. Same women, two weeks later, their blood uh, dripped on a new carpet of breast cancer cells, and this is all that's left. Just a few individual cancer cells remain. Their bodies cleaned up before and after. Just two weeks eating healthy, their bloodstream became that much more hostile to cancer. Slowing down the growth of cancer cells is nice. Getting rid of them is even better. This is what's called apoptosis, programmed cell death. After eating healthy, their own bodies were able to somehow reprogram the cancer cells, forcing them into early retirement. This is what's called tunnel imaging, measuring DNA fragmentation, cell death, so dying cancer cells show up as little white spots. So again, this is the before, what the blood of your average woman can do to breast cancer cells. So you can knock off a few. You can see one dying cancer cell there in the upper left. Uh, but then after 14 days of healthy plant-based living, her blood can do this. It's like you're an entirely different person inside. The same blood now coursing through these women's bodies gained the power to significantly slow down and stop breast cancer cell growth after just two weeks eating a plant-based diet. What kind of blood do we want in our body? What kind of immune system? Uh, do we want blood that just kind of rolls over when new cancer cells pop up? Or do we want blood circulating to every nook and cranny in our body with the power to slow down and stop it? Now, this dramatic strengthening of cancer defenses was after 14 days of a plant-based diet and exercise. They had these women out walking 30 to 60 minutes a day. Well, if you do two things, how do you know what role the diet played? So researchers decided to put it to the test. This is measuring cancer cell clearance, is what we saw before. The effect of blood taken from those who ate a plant-based diet, in this case for an average of 14 years, along with 
mild exercise, just like out walking every day, plant-based diet and walking. That's the kind of cancer cell clearance you get. Compare that to the cancer-stopping power of your average sedentary American, which is basically non-existent. This middle group, though, instead of 14 years on a plant-based diet, 14 years standard American diet, but 14 years of daily strenuous hour-long exercise like calisthenics, the researchers want to know if you exercise hard enough, if you exercise long enough, can you rival some strolling plant eaters over there? And the answer is exercise help, no question. But literally 5,000 hours in the gym was no match for a plant-based diet. Same uh, tunnel imaging as before. Even if you're a couch potato, eating fried potatoes, your body's not totally defenseless. Your bloodstream can kill off a few cancer cells. But exercise for 5,000 hours, you can kill cancer cells left and right, but nothing appears to kick more cancer tush than a plant-based diet. We think it's because of animal proteins, meat, egg white, and dairy proteins, increasing the level of IGF-1 in our bodies, insulin-like growth factor 1, a cancer-promoting growth hormone involved in the acquisition and progression of malignant tumors. Here's the experiment that really nailed IGF-1 as the villain. Same as last time, go on a plant-based diet, cancer cell growth drops, cancer cell death shoots up. But then here's the kicker. What if you add back to the cancer, just the amount of IGF-1 banished from your body because you started eating healthier? It effectively erases the diet and exercise effect. It's like you never started eating healthy at all. So the reason one of the largest prospective studies on diet and cancer found the incidence of all cancers combined was lower among those eating more plant-based, maybe because they're eating less animal protein, less meat, egg white, and dairy protein, so end up with less IGF-1, which means less cancer growth. How much less cancer? Middle-aged men and women with high protein intakes had a 75% increase in overall mortality and a fourfold increase in the risk of dying specifically from cancer. But not all proteins, specifically animal protein, which makes sense given the higher IGF-1 levels. The academic institution sent out a press release with a memorable opening line. That chicken wing you're eating could be as deadly as a cigarette, explaining that eating a Diet rich in animal proteins during middle age makes you four times more likely to die from cancer, a mortality risk factor comparable to smoking cigarettes. What was the response to the revelation that diets high in meat, eggs, and dairy could be harmful to health as smoking? Well, one nutrition scientist replied that it was potentially dangerous to compare the effects of smoking with the effects of meat and dairy. Why? Because the smoker might think, why bother quitting smoking if my ham and cheese sandwich is just as bad for me? So better not tell anyone about the whole animal protein thing. That reminds me of a famous Philip Morris cigarette ad that tried to downplay the risk by saying, hey, you think secondhand smoke is bad, increasing the risk of lung cancer 19%. Well, hey, drinking one or two glasses of milk every day may be three times as bad, 62% higher risk of lung cancer or doubling your risk frequently cooking with oil, or, or tripling your risk of heart disease by eating non-vegetarian, or multiplying your risk sixfold by eating lots of mean dairy. So, they conclude, let's keep some perspective here. The risk of lung cancer from secondhand smoke may be well below that of other everyday activities, so breathe deep. It's like saying, and don't worry about getting stabbed, because getting shot is so much worse. Right? Uh, how about neither? Two risks don't make a right. Of course, you know Philip Morris stopped throwing dairy under the bus once they purchased Kraft Foods. Just saying. In the beginning, blueberries were the best. Then walnuts took the title, then wild blueberries took it back. Then small red beans were considered the number one most antioxidant-packed foods, until herbs and spices were tested. Frankly, I thought it was over in 2007. Remember, USDA had released a database of 277 foods? 
When only 40 foods were tested, blueberries were number one, but when hundreds of foods were tested, blueberries no longer even made the top 10. I ranked them for you by serving size and by cost, you know, antioxidant bang for your buck. Mission accomplished until last year. The total antioxidant content of more than 3,000 foods, beverages, spices, herbs, and supplements used worldwide. The most comprehensive such study ever, by far. Are there even 3,000 foods out there? Just looking at the first page of the 138-page chart they include with the study, you know you're in for a wild ride when they don't just include something like gooseberries, or Indian gooseberries, or Indian gooseberries in a can, but even the antioxidant power of the syrup in this can of Indian gooseberries. They tested 30 different beers. For those who stay up all night wondering if there's more antioxidants in Coors or Bud Light, the answer? Miller, by a hair. But nothing compared, evidently, to Santa Claus beer from Austria, which put Guinness to shame and all the rest. Don't laugh. The standard American diet is so pitiful that beer represents the fifth largest source of antioxidants in the United States. They measured Captain Crunch, the antioxidant content of Tootsie Rolls, everything from Krispy Kreme to the crushed dried leaves of the African baobab tree, the skin of an organic lemon Norwegian jungle dessert. It took them eight years to compile all this data. With 3,139 foods tested, you can get as nitty-gritty as you want. Like those new gold kiwis, do they have more antioxidants than the regular green ones? About three times as much. This body of work can help us decide hundreds of real-life grocery store decisions we make all the time, but it's easy to get lost in the details. Let's take a step back, which is what the researchers did. What does this body of work say about what we should eat in general? The first thing they did, table one, was to split everything into plant foods versus animal foods. Here's the plant foods. Here's animal foods. On average, plant foods have 64 times more antioxidants than meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. This alone represents a powerful argument to eat a plant-based diet. Every time you eat something in this column, you miss out on an opportunity to eat something in this column. Animal foods max out at 100. Plant foods go up to 289,000. Quoting from the conclusion, antioxidant-rich foods originate from the plant kingdom, while meat, fish, and other foods from the animal kingdom are low in antioxidants. Diets comprised mainly of animal-based foods are thus low in antioxidant content, while diets based mainly on a variety of plant-based foods are antioxidant-rich, due to the thousands of bioactive antioxidants, phytochemicals found in plants. Why is there such a huge disparity in prostate cancer rates? The incidence of clinically malignant prostate cancer is highest in African Americans, some 30-fold greater than in Japanese men, and 120 times greater than seen in Chinese men in Shanghai. Well, in general, the Western diet is one in which animal protein and fat consumption is high, whereas the fiber intake is low. In contrast, the proportion of the total caloric intake from animal fat in the more vegetarian-style oriental diet is low, and the fiber content is higher, so maybe diet is playing a role in some of these diseases. But these healthier diets are not just low in animal proteins and fat and high in starch and fiber. They're also rich in weak plant estrogens. This study, for example, found higher levels of phytoestrogens in the prostate fluids of men in countries with relatively low rates of prostate cancer. In vitro studies have shown lignans can slow the growth of prostate cancer cells in a petri dish, so a pilot study was launched on 
flaxseed supplementation in men with prostate cancer before surgery. Why flaxseeds? Because while these anti-cancer lignans are found throughout the plant kingdom, flaxseeds have up to 800 times more than any other food. So they took a bunch of men with prostate cancer about a month before they were scheduled for surgery to get their prostates removed, and started them on a relatively low-fat diet with three tablespoons of ground flaxseed to see what effect it might have on the growth of their tumors. And though they were skeptical that they would observe any difference in tumor biology in the diet-treated patients, with such a short-term dietary intervention, just within those few weeks they found significantly lower cancer proliferation rates and significantly higher rates of cancer cell death. Now this was compared to so-called historical controls, meaning compared to the kind of cancer growth one typically sees in their situation, not to an actual you know, randomized control group. But a few years later, a study was finally published in which men could act as their own controls. Uh, these were men that just got their prostates biopsied and were scheduled to get a repeat biopsy in six months' time. So they did the same thing. After the first biopsy, they reduced the fat in their diet and put them on ground flaxseeds to see if it you know, made their repeat biopsy look any different. Uh, these were men with what's called PIN, which is like uh, the, the prostate equivalent of ductal carcinoma in situ in the breast, an early stage of cancer. Uh, that's why they were getting repeat biopsies, to make sure it wasn't spreading. And this is what they found. Significant drop in PSA levels, which is a biomarker of prostate cell growth, a uh, drop in cholesterol, which is what we'd expect with a lower-fat diet and all that extra fiber, and importantly, a significant decrease in the cellular proliferation rate. In fact, in two of the men, their PSA levels dropped so much they didn't even have to go through with the second biopsy at all. There hasn't been much research on this kind of precancerous prostatic hyperplasia, with only four epidemiological studies reported at the time. They yielded varying findings with increased risk associated with higher NG protein and animal product intake, and decreased risk related to consumption of alcohol, fruit, and green and yellow vegetables. In some, a low-fat plant-based diet high in phytoestrogens. It is estimated that tumors start around the age of 20, yet detection of cancer is normally around the age of 50 or later, thus it takes cancer decades to incubate. Why does it take so long? Recent studies indicate that in any given type of cancer, hundreds of different genes must be modified to change a normal cell into a cancer cell. Although cancers are characterized by the dysregulation of cell signaling pathways in multiple steps, most current anti-cancer therapies involve the modulation of a single target. Chemotherapy has gotten incredibly specific, but the ineffectiveness, a lack of safety, high cost of these monotargeted therapies have led to real disappointment, and drug companies are now trying to develop chemo drugs to take a more multi-targeted approach. As a result, many pharmaceutical companies are increasingly interested in developing multi-targeted therapies. Many Plant-based products, however, accomplish multi-targeting naturally, and in addition are inexpensive and safe compared to drugs. However, because drug companies are not usually able to secure intellectual property rights to plants, the development of plant-based anti-cancer therapies has not been prioritized. They may work. They may work better, for all we know. They may be safer. They may actually be safe, period. If you were going to choose one plant-based product to start testing, one might choose curcumin, the pigment in the spice turmeric, the reason curry powder looks yellow. Well, before you start throwing money at research, you might want to start asking some basic questions, like do populations that eat a lot of turmeric have lower cancer rates? The incidence of cancer does appear to be significantly lower in regions where turmeric is heavily consumed. Population-based data indicate that some Extremely common cancers in the Western world are much less prevalent in regions where turmeric is widely consumed in the diet. For example, overall cancer rates are much lower in India than in Western countries. Much lower. U.S. men get 23 times more prostate cancer than men in India. Americans get between 
8 and 14 times the rate of melanoma, 10 to 11 times more colorectal cancer, 9 times more endometrial cancer, 7 to 17 times more lung cancer, 7 to 8 times more bladder cancer, 5 times more breast cancer, and 9 to 12 times more kidney cancer. This is not like 5, 10, or 20 percent more, but times more, so hundreds of percent more breast cancer, thousands of percent more prostate cancer. Differences even greater than some of those found in the China study. Because Indians account for one-sixth of the world's population and have some of the highest spice consumption in the world, epi epidemiologic studies in this country have great potential for improving our understanding of the relationship between diet and cancer. Of course, it may not be the spices. I mean, several dietary factors may contribute to the low overall rate of cancer in India. Among them, a relatively low intake of meat, a mostly plant-based diet, in addition to the high intake of spices, 40% of Indians are vegetarians. And even the ones that do eat meat don't eat a lot. And it's not only what they don't eat, but what they do. India is one of the largest producers and consumers of frets, fresh fruits and vegetables. And they eat a lot of pulses, meaning legumes, you know, beans, chickpeas, and lentils. And it's not just turmeric. They eat a wide variety of spices, which constitute, by weight, the most antioxidant-packed class of foods in the world. Population studies can't prove a correlation between dietary turmeric and decreased cancer risk, but certainly inspired a bunch of research. So far, curcumin has been tested against a variety of human cancers, including colorectal cancer, pancreatic cancer, breast, prostate, multiple myeloma, lung cancer, and head and neck cancer for both prevention and treatment. We'll look at some of that research next. Once in a while, I come across a study that's so juicy I do an entire video about it. It's like my you know, which fruit fights cancer better video, or the best cooking method one, or that one comparing thousands of foods. Well, this is one such study. A group of researchers at U of F, Gainesville, and Penn State set up an elegant experiment. We've known you know, ounce per ounce that uh, herbs and spices have the, some of the greatest antioxidant activities known, but that's in a test tube. Before we can ask if an herb or spice has health benefits, it's first necessary to determine whether it's bioavailable. This has never been done until now. They could have went the easy route and just measured the change in antioxidant level in one's bloodstream before and after consumption, but the assumption that the appearance of antioxidant activity in the blood is an indicator of bioavailability has a weakness. Maybe more gets absorbed than we think, but doesn't show up on antioxidant tests because it gets bound up to protein or cells, so they attempted to measure physiological changes in the blood. They were interested in whether absorbed compounds would be able to protect white blood cells from an oxidative or inflammatory injury, whether it would protect the strands of our DNA from breaking when confronted by free radicals. They also wondered if the consumption of herbs and spices might alter cellular inflammatory responses in the presence of a physiologically relevant inflammatory insult. What does this all mean? Well, what they did was take a bunch of people and had each of them eat different types of spices for a week. There's so many really unique things about this study, but one was that the quantity that study subjects consumed was based on the usual levels of consumption in actual food, like the oregano group was given a half teaspoon a day, uh, the kinds of practical quantities people might actually eat once in a while. Then at the end of the week, they drew blood from the dozen or so people they had adding black pepper to their diets that week, and compared the, result, the effects of their blood to the effects of the blood of the dozen on cayenne, or cinnamon, or cloves, or cumin. They had about 10 different groups of people eating about 10 different spices. Then they dripped their plasma, the liquid fraction of their blood, onto human white blood cells in a petri dish that had been exposed to an inflammatory insult. Uh, they wanted to pick something really inflammatory, so they chose oxidized cholesterol, which is like what you'd get in your bloodstream after eating something like fried chicken. So they jabbed the white blood cells with oxidized cholesterol and then measured how much TNF they produced in response. Tumor necrosis factor is a powerful inflammatory cytokine, infamous 
for the role it plays in autoimmune tacts like inflammatory bowel disease, compared to the blood of those who ate no spices for a week, was the blood of those eating black pepper able to significantly dampen the inflammatory response? No. What about any of these other spices? Cloves, ginger, rosemary, and turmeric were able to significantly stifle the inflammatory response. And remember, remember, they weren't dripping the spices themselves on these human white blood cells, but the blood of those who ate the spices. And so it represents what might happen when cells in our body are exposed to the levels of spices that circulate in our bloodstream after normal daily consumption. Not you know, mega doses in some pill, just the amount that you know, makes our spaghetti sauce taste good, or our pumpkin pie, or curry sauce. There are drugs that can do the same thing, uh, tumor necrosis factors are such major mediators of inflammation and inflammation-related re diseases that there are these TNF-blocking drugs on the market for the treatment of inflammatory diseases like osteoarthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, psoriasis, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, which rake in collectively more than $20 billion a year. Uh, because drug companies charge people $15,000 to $20,000 a year for the drug. At that price, the side effects better be hugs and rainbows. But no, these drugs carry a black label warning because they can cause things like mm, cancer, heart failure. If only there were a cheaper, safer solution. Curcumin, the yellow pigment in turmeric, a spice that's a tad cheaper and safer, but does it work outside of a test tube? There's evidence that it may help in all the diseases for which TNF blockers are currently being used. And so with healthcare costs and safety being such major issues, this golden spice turmeric may help provide the solution. In designing an antibiotic, you wouldn't create a drug that destroyed DNA, for example, because that's something that both humans and bacteria share in common. It would kill the bacteria all right, but it might kill us too. So many antibiotics work by attacking the bacterial cell wall, something bacteria have that we don't. Antifungals can attack the unique cell walls of fungus. Pesticides can work by attacking the special exoskeleton of in insects, but fighting cancer is harder, because cancer cells are our own cells. So fighting cancer comes down to trying to find and exploit differences between cancer cells and normal cells. Forty years ago, a landmark paper was published showing for the first time that many human cancers have what's called absolute methionine dependency, meaning you can grow normal cells in a petri dish without giving them the amino acid methionine. Normal cells thrive, but without methionine, cancer cells die. Normal breast cells, for example, grow no matter what, with or without. But here's leukemia cells. They need that extra added methionine to grow, or they just flatline. What does cancer do with the methionine? Tumors generate gaseous sulfur-containing compounds with it uh, that specially trained diagnostic dogs can actually pick up. There are mole-sniffing dogs that can pick out skin cancer. There are breath-sniffing dogs that can pick out people with lung cancer. Pee-sniffing dogs that can diagnose bladder cancer. And yes, you guessed it, fart-sniffing dogs for colorectal cancer. Doctors can now bring their lab to the lab. Gives a whole new meaning to the term PET scan. Anyway, methionine dependency is not just present in cancer cell lines in a petri dish. Fresh tumors taken from patients show that many cancers appear to have biochemical defects that makes them methionine dependent including some tumors of the colon, breast, ovary, prostate, and skin. 
Chemo companies are fighting to be the first to come out with methionine-depleting drugs, but since methionine is sourced mainly from food, a better strategy may be to lower methionine levels by lower meth lowering methionine intake, right? eliminating high methionine foods for cancer growth control. Here's the thinking. Look, can, uh, smoking cessation, uh, consumption of diets rich in plants, and other lifestyle measures can prevent the majority of cancers. Unfortunately, people don't do them, and as a result, each year hundreds of thousands of Americans develop metastatic cancer. Chemotherapy cures only a few types of metastatic cancer. Unfortunately, the vast majority of common metastatic cancers, like breast, prostate, colon, and lung, are lethal. We therefore desperately need novel treatment strategies for metastatic cancer, and dietary methionine restriction may be one such strategy. So, where is methionine found? Particularly chicken and fish. Milk, red meat, and eggs has less, but if you really want to stick with lower methionine foods, fruits, nuts, veggies, grains, and beans. In other words, methionine restriction may be achieved using a predominantly vegan diet. So why isn't every oncologist doing this? Uh, despite many promising preclinical and clinical studies in recent years, dietary methionine restriction and other dietary approaches to cancer treatment have not yet gained widespread clinical application. Most clinicians and investigators are probably unfamiliar with nutritional approaches to cancer. Ah, uh, that's an understatement. Many others may consider amino acid restriction as an old idea, since it's been examined for several decades. However, many good ideas remain latent for decades, if not centuries, before they prove valuable in the clinic. With the proper development, dietary methionine restriction, either alone or in combination with other treatments, may prove to have a major impact on patients with cancer. Colorectal cancer is the third most common cause of cancer death in the world. Thankfully, the good bacteria in our gut take the fiber we eat and make short-chain fatty acids like butyrate that protect us from cancer. We take care of them, they take care of us. If you do nothing to colon cancer cells, they grow. That's what cancer does. But if you expose colon cancer cells to the concentration of butyrate our good bacteria make in our gut when we eat fiber, the growth is stopped in its tracks. But if the butyrate stops, if we just eat healthy for one day and then turn off the fiber, the cancer can resume its growth. So ideally we have to eat lots of fiber-rich foods, meaning whole plant foods, every single day. But what about the populations, like in modern sub-Saharan Africa, where they don't eat a lot of fiber, yet still rarely get colon cancer? They used to eat a lot of fiber, but now their diet is centered around highly refined cornmeal, so low fiber, yet still low colon cancer rates. This was explained by the fact that while they may be lacking protective factors like fiber, they're also lacking cancer-promoting factors like animal protein and fat. But are they really lacking protective factors? If you measure the pH of their stools, the black populations in South Africa have more acidic stools. Lower pH means more acidic, uh, despite comparable fiber intakes. Uh, as we learned before, that's a good thing. We want alkaline pee, acidic poo. And that may account for the lower cancer rates. But wait a second, low colon pH is caused by short-chain fatty acids, which are produced by our good bacteria when they eat fiber. And they weren't eating any more fiber, suggesting there's something else in addition to fiber in their diets that was feeding their flora. And indeed, despite low fiber intake, the bacteria in their colon were still churning out short-chain fatty acids like crazy. But if their bacteria wasn't eating fiber, what were they eating? 
resistant starch. The method of cooking and eating the cornmeal as a porridge resulted in an increase in something called resistant starch, which acts in the same way as fiber in the colon, as a prebiotic, a food for our good bacteria to produce those same cancer-preventing short-chain fatty acids. Resistant starch is any starch that resists digestion, is not digested and absorbed in the upper digestive tract, our small intestine, and so passes down into the large bowel, our colon, to feed our good bacteria. See, when you boil starches and then let them cool, some of the starch can recrystallize into a form resistant to our digestive enzymes. So we can get resistant starch eating cooled starches, pasta salad, potato salad, or cold cornmeal porridge. So this may help explain the striking differences in colon cancer rates. Thus, they were feeding their good bacteria after all, but just with lots of starch rather than fiber. Consequently, a high-carbohydrate diet may act in the same way as a high-fiber diet. Because a small fraction of the carbs make it down into our colon, the more carbs we eat, the more butyrate our gut bacteria can produce. And indeed, countries that eat the most starch have some of the lowest colon cancer rates. So fiber may not be the only protective factor. Now, only about 5% of starch may reach the colon, compared to 100% of the fiber. But we eat up to 10 times more starch than fiber, so it can potentially play a significant role feeding our flora. So the, we're talking about even non-resistant starch. So the protection Africans enjoy from cancer may be twofold— a diet high in resistant starch and low in animal products. Just eating more resistant starch isn't enough. See, meat contains or contributes to the production of presumed carcinogens such as N-nitroso compounds. If you split people up into three groups, and you put one group on a low-meat diet, second group on a high-meat diet, which includes uh, beef, pork, poultry, and the last group on the same high-meat diet but with lots of resistant starch added, the high-meat groups had three times more of these presumptive carcinogens and twice the ammonia in their stool than the low meat group, and the addition of the resistant starch did not seem to help. This confirms that exposure to these toxic compounds is increased with meat intake, and 90% was created in our bowel. So it doesn't matter if we get nitrite-free, uncured fresh meat, these nitrosamines are created from the meat as it sits in our colon. This may help explain the higher incidence of bowel cancer in meat-eating populations, along with the increase in ammonia, uh, neither of which could be helped by just adding resistant starch on top of the meat. So the deleterious effects of animal products on colonic metabolism override the potentially beneficial effects of other protective nutrients. So we should do a combination of both more whole plant foods and less meat, along with exercise, not only for our colon, but also for general health. Back in the 1960s, a patient isolator unit was developed for cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy. Because our immune system cells were often caught in the friendly fire, up to 50% of cancer patients died of infections before they even completed the chemo because their immune systems had become so compromised. So they developed this bubble boy-like contraption where they shave you, dip you in disinfectant, rinse you off with alcohol, antibiotic ointment in every orifice, and a rotating regimen of a dozen of the most powerful antibiotics we had. Procedures were performed through plastic sleeves, and everything in and out had to be sterilized and passed through airlocks, and so no fresh fruits and vegetables. People went crazy cooped up in these things, with 38% of people starting to hallucinate. Fifteen years later, the results were in. It simply 
didn't work. People were dying at the same rate, so the whole thing was scrapped, except the diet. The airlocks and alcohol baths were banned, but they continued to make sure no one got to eat a salad. Uh, neutrophils are a front line of defense white blood cells, and so when we're immunocompromised, when we don't have enough neutrophils, we're called neutropenic, so uh, patients are put on a neutropenic diet, no fresh fruits and vegetables. The only thing is, is that there's a striking lack of evidence that such a diet actually helps. Ironically, the neutropenic diet is the one component that's still practiced, yet has the least evidence supporting its use. The rationale was like, look, there's bacteria on salad, bacteria cause infections, and so look, immunocompromised patients are at increased risk of infections, so no salad for you. And frankly, we're glad there's no studies on it, because it could be way too risky to give a cancer patient a salad. So its continued use seemed to be based on this kind of better safe than sorry philosophy. OK, but the problem is, look, kids diagnosed with cancer come in already low in dietary antioxidants. The last thing you'd think you'd want to say is no fresh fruit. So in addition to the lack of clinical evidence for this diet, there may be some drawbacks. Maybe restriction of fruits and vegetables may increase the risk of infection, compromise the nutritional status. So are neutropenic diets for cancer patients reasonable prudence or clinical superstition? A resurgence of research started during the 90s, when the need to support clinical practice with, wait for it, evidence became increasingly important. What a concept. In other words, you don't know until you put it to the test. Three randomized controlled trials were published, and none supported the neutropenic diet. This was the biggest an all-cooked diet versus one that allowed raw fruits and vegetables, and there was no difference in infection and death rates. As, of this, as a result of this study, the principal investigator at the MD Anderson Cancer Center described how their practice has changed, and now everyone is allowed to eat their vegetables. A far cry from the please don't eat the salads 31 years earlier. Today, neither the FDA nor the CDC support the neutropenic diet, nor does the American Cancer Society. Right, the real danger are the pathogenic food poisoning bacteria, Campylobacter, Salmonella, E. coli. So you still have to keep people away from risky foods like undercooked eggs, meat, dairy, and sprouts. Uh, at this point, there really shouldn't even be a debate, though. Uh, yet many institutions continue to tell cancer patients they shouldn't eat fresh fruits and veggies. According to the latest survey, more than half of pediatric cancer doctors continue to prescribe these diets though it's quite variable even among those at the same institution. Why are doctors still reluctant to move away from the neutropenic diet? Well, there are several reasons why doctors may be hesitant to incorporate evidence-based medicine into their practice. They have limited time to review the literature. They'd like to dig deep into studies, but they simply don't have the time to look at the evidence. That's what nutritionfacts.org is for. Bone marrow transplants are the final frontier. Sometimes it's our immune system itself that is cancerous, leukemia, lymphoma. And so the immune system is wiped out on purpose to rebuild from scratch, and so inherent in the procedure is a profound immunodeficiency, for which a neutropenic diet is often recommended, but had never been tested until now. Not only did it not work, a strict neutropenic diet was actually associated with an increased risk for infection, maybe because you didn't have uh, all the good bugs from fruits and veggies crowding out the bad guys in the gut. Not only was the neutropenic diet not beneficial, but there was a suggestion that it could be potentially harmful. It would not be the first time that an intervention strategy made good theoretical sense, but ultimately was ineffective when put to the test. In people without a personal history of cardiovascular disease, the risks of aspirin may outweigh the benefits, but aspirin may have additional benefits as well. We have long recognized the preventive role of daily aspirin for patients with heart disease. However, it now appears we can now hatch two birds from one egg. Daily low-dose aspirin may also help prevent certain forms of cancer as well. 
In an analysis of eight different studies involving more than 25,000 people, the authors found a 20% decrease in risk of death from cancer among those randomized to a daily aspirin. Uh, you know, the search for effective and safe treatments for cancer remains an enormous burdensome challenge. If only we could stop cancer in its tracks, prevent it before it strikes. Well, perhaps we can with this planned phytonutrient, salicylic acid, found in aspirin. How does it affect cancer? Well, the Nobel Prize in Medicine went to the team that discovered how aspirin works. Enzymes named COX uh, cyclooxygenase take the pro-inflammatory omega-6 fatty acid, arachidonic acid, that our body makes, or we get directly in our diet from mainly chicken and eggs. Our enzymes take the arachidonic acid and turn it into inflammatory mediators like thromboxane, which produces thrombosis, uh, clots, and prostaglandins, which cause inflammation. Aspirin suppresses these enzymes, though, so less thromboxane means fewer clots, and less prostaglandin means less pain, swelling, and fever. But prostaglandins can also dilate the lymphatic vessels inside tumors, allowing cancer cells to spread. So one of the ways cancer tries to kill us is by boosting COX activity. That's one of the ways we think aspirin can help prevent cancer, by counteracting tumor attempts to pry open the lymphatic bars on its cage and spread throughout the body. Because the reduction in mortality due to some cancers occurred within two to three years after aspirin was started. That seems too quick to be accounted for by an effect only on the genesis and formation of cancer. Cancer can take decades to develop. So, the only way aspirin could save us that fast is by suppressing the growth and spread of tumors that already exist. Aspirin appeared to cut the risk of metastases in half, particularly for adenocarcinomas like colon cancer. So now what about everyone taking a daily baby aspirin? Previous risk-benefit analyses did not consider the effects of aspirin on cancer, instead just balancing cardiovascular benefits with bleeding risks. But these new cancer findings may change things. If this was just a reduction of colon cancer risk, then the benefits might not outweigh the harms for the general public. But now we have evidence that it works against other cancers too. Even a 10% reduction in overall cancer incidence could tip the balance in favor of benefits versus risks. So how does the cancer benefit compare? As we saw before, Using aspirin in healthy people just for cardiovascular protection is kind of a wash. By contrast, the cancer prevention rates might save twice as many lives, so the benefits may outweigh the risks. If you put it all together, heart attacks, strokes, cancer, and bleeding, aspirin comes out looking protective overall, potentially extending our lifespan. Yes, higher risk of major bleeding, even at low-dose aspirin, but fewer heart attacks, clotting strokes, and cancer, so may be beneficial overall. Now note these age categories only go up to 74 years old, though. That's because the risk of bleeding on aspirin increases steeply with age, and so may tip the balance the other way. Uh, but in younger folks, this data certainly has the research community buzzing. The emerging evidence on aspirin's cancer protection highlights an exciting time for cancer prevention. In light of low-dose aspirin's ability to reduce mortality from both vascular events and cancer to a very notable degree, it's tempting to recommend low-dose aspirin for nearly everybody. However, aspirin pills, even at low doses, has a propensity to damage the lining of our stomach and intestines, increase the risk of gastrointestinal bleeding. This, may, this fact may constrain health authorities from recommending aspirin for the general population. Recent meta-analyses estimate that just a single year of low-dose aspirin therapy will induce major gastrointestinal bleeding in one out of 833 people. If only there are a way to get the benefits without the risks. Those who remember this video already know the answer. The aspirin phytonutrient isn't just found in willow trees but throughout the plant kingdom. This explains why the active ingredient in aspirin is found normally in the bloodstream, even in people not taking aspirin. Here's the levels of aspirin in people that eat fruits and vegetables. And here's the level found in those that don't. Then drink just one fruit smoothie, and within an hour and a half your levels rise. As you can see, one smoothie ain't going to do it. You have to regularly 
eat daily fruit and vegetable consumption. But are these kind of aspirin levels sufficient to suppress the expression of that inflammatory enzyme implicated in cancer growth and spread? Well, using umbilical cords and foreskins— where else are you going to get human tissue? They found that even those low levels caused by smoothie consumption significantly suppress the expression of that inflammatory enzyme at a genetic level. Well, if this aspirin phytonutrient is made by plants, we might expect plant eaters to have higher levels. And indeed, not only did they find higher blood levels in vegetarians, there was an overlap with people taking aspirin pills. Some vegetarians have the same level in their blood as people actually taking aspirin. Vegetarians pee out as much of the active metabolite of a as aspirin as aspirin users do, uh, just because they're eating so many fruits and vegetables. Because the anti-inflammatory action of aspirin is probably the res result of this active ingredient in aspirin, salicylic acid, and the concentrations of salicylic acid seen in vegetarians has been shown to inhibit that inflammatory COX enzyme in vitro, it's plausible that dietary salicylates may contribute to the beneficial effects of a vegetarian diet, although they say it seems unlikely the most omnivores would be able to achieve sufficient dietary intake of uh, uh, salicylates to have a therapeutic effect, though they could certainly eat more fruit and veggies too. With effectively all that aspirin flowing through their systems, uh, plant eaters must have high ulcer rates, right? Aspirin can just chew through our gut. But no, vegetarians appear to have a significantly lower risk of ulcers for both men and women. Uh, so for the general population, by eating plants instead of taking aspirin, uh, we may not just get the benefits without the risk, we can get benefits with benefits. How is that possible? Because in plants, the salicylic acid may come naturally prepackaged with gut protective nutrients. For example, nitric oxide from dietary nitrates exerts stomach protective effects by boosting blood flow and protective mucus production in the lining of the stomach, effects that demonstrably oppose the pro ulcerative impact of aspirin. Dark green leafy vegetables are among the richest dietary sources of nitrate, but of course the researchers go on to say, since it may be unrealistic to expect people to eat ample servings of greens every day, we should just give people pills with their pills, right? nitrate pills with their aspirin pills. But why not just eat our greens? People who've had a heart attack should follow their physician's advice, which probably includes taking aspirin every day. But what about everyone else? I think. Everyone should take aspirin, but in produce, not pill form. The world would not only have prevented cancer from ever happening, it can reverse, can reverse any cancer there are. Otto Warburg, two-time Nobel Prize winner, so was it some dumb guy? The cause of cancer is no longer a mystery. We know it occurs whenever any cell is denied 60% of its oxygen requirements. When the cell doesn't have oxygen, it begins to turn cancers. The cells have to have oxygen to survive. Because what does the cell use? What does a normal cell use to survive? Oxygen. And what does the cancer cell use to survive? Sugar. It has to have oxygen to survive. And that's what they, they discovered. Being oxygen deprived is one of the major causes of all your illnesses. Oxygen deprivation in your body. One of the one of one of cancer's primary characteristics is a lack of oxygen in the cell and blood. Cells do not function the way that we are intended to function with depleted oxygen supplies. Your cells will not do what they're supposed to do if they don't have oxygen. They have to have oxygen in order to do what they need to do, to replicate normally. And so for next, for in six months from now, do you have good, for you to have good heart cells, for you to have good pancreatic cells, for you to have good lung cells and breath cells and all the rest of the cells, your cell has to have oxygen so next year it's going to replicate itself and keep replicating itself normally again. Causes of oxygen depletion. Number one, toxicity and acidity. Toxicity. And so toxicity and acidity cause a residue which coats the membrane of the cell. Coats the membrane. So remember, the, the membrane on a cell, a membrane on a cell, as long as it has what it needs, will let oxygen, will let oxygen come into it. It'll let oxygen in. And so what happens is when you're toxic and acidic, what happens is you start creating Around the cell, right along the cell, you start creating a coating on that cell. Your cells become coated. 
and they become coated and they get a sticky residue and a residue there. And so now, what can't get into this cell? Oxygen can't get into that cell. So now the cell starts becoming, starts becoming cancerous. And as the cell becomes cancerous, it starts forming its eight receptor sites for what? Sugar. Sugar. And sugar gets <coughs> in. The cancer cell, you're going to see well, how sugar gets in in a second, how powerful this is. But toxicity causes a residue which coats the membrane of the cell, present, prevents it from breathing. What we talked about, in, auto intoxication happens. It gets suffocated in there. It can't breathe properly. It suffocates the cell, becomes cancerous. Smoking. So everybody wants to know, well, why does smoking cause problems? You know, is it the nicotine, whatever it is? No, the problem really is that when you bring smoke into your body, cigarettes contain carbon monoxide, whatever you're smoking, whether the cigarette's not. If you're smoking something, it has carbon monoxide in it, it competes with oxygen. Carbon monoxide doesn't like oxygen. Those of you know, what, what would happen, is carbon monoxide poisoning good or bad? It's bad, it kills you because it takes all the oxygen out of your body. You die. There's carbon monoxide in this room long enough, all the oxygen comes out of our body. We die. Every time we smoke, what are you doing? You're suffocating yourself. You're suffocating your cells. You're killing your cells. If you are a smoker, quit immediately. It's a dangerous, dangerous poison. And you will get some form of cancer somewhere in your body. Somewhere. At one, one time or another. But look at this. Chlorine. Whew. I was, I've been big on this one lately. Chlorine takes oxygen right out of your cells. Cells can't survive. Chlorine gets in your body. How do we get chlorine in our body? What's the number one way we get it? Showers. Showers. Bathing in it. Swimming in it. Your jacuzzi. Putting it on your hands. Chlorine. You have to take chlorine immediately out of your water in your homes. We're not telling you your kids can never swim again, but I think if you took the chlorine out of your house at least, and they're bathing and showering in it, the problem with showering is, is what else do you get when you shower? Smell it. You absorb it. You absorb it. How? It turns into what? Steam. Steam goes where? Right into the brain right into the brain. That's why, if just like in any substance, if you took cocaine and snorted it or smoked it, which one do you get high faster on? Snorting it. Smoking it. Smoking goes, smoking absorbs it like this. That's why people get addicted to crack faster. You'll get addicted to cocaine as fast as crack because smoking, when anything turns into a gas, it goes right into the body and absorbs it immediately. That's why hot tubs are the most dangerous place you could ever be in because what is it? It's a chlorine bomb. You're breathing in you're breathing in a gas of chlorine the whole entire time. These bulls aren't near as dangerous as even as dangerous, not near as dangerous as the hot tub. So what do you do? You need a chlorine-free house and a chlorine-free hot tub. Don't go to the hot tubs in your gym. Sorry. If you can, oh, it feels good. You're gonna die in there. So go get a massage or something. Don't sit. Don't sit in the hot tub ever. Hopefully, we're working. Hopefully, with a lot of these places are gonna start getting chlorine stuff. I have a chlorine-free hot tub. I don't often they can't do it. You get an H2 filter. You clean it out. Clean out your water supply. You don't need swimming pools anymore with chlorine in it. Do you, does it cost a little bit more money? Yes. Uh, guaranteed. They said, hey, if your kids want to swim, give us an extra dollar a month and we want to take the chlorine out. Everybody was surprised. They said, yes, yes. That's all it would cost for most places. we got to get the chlorine out of everything. Chlorine takes oxygen out of the cell, which creates cancer. Water. Your cells are made of water. Your cell has to have water to survive. Water is an adhesive that bonds your cell structure. Water is essential to cleansing your body. 80% of your cells are, are made of what? Water. Needs water. It lubricates, flushes waste, toxins out of the body, cleanses your internal organs, eliminates toxins from your bloodstream. You need water. How much of water do you need? One liter per 50 pounds. Unless you're real sick, we may do a little bit more than that. What kind of water do you need? Clean water. Not chlorine water. You drink tap water. All tap water is full of what? Chlorine and lots of it. Because, because why? Because it's sewage water. Usually they have to get what out of there? The bad stuff, but what do they use to clean water? Chlorine. Plus a million other things they use. It, it, it is not, you should not ever, <coughs> besides the bacteria and all the drugs inside of it, you can't, you can't, even with chlorine doesn't get a lot of antibiotics out of the water and everything else out of the water. So we need to have a clean water supply. Most drinking water contains 2,100 toxic chemicals that cause cancer. Regular, regular drinking water. Carcinogens in drinking water are the contributing to all cancers in the U.S. That came from the Environmental Quality Agency, Council on Environmental Quality. That's, they're the ones saying that. That's how dangerous us drinking certain water is. So right now, everybody's here saying, is it, if you're saying all this, this is all true, wouldn't everybody get cancer? What's everybody getting now? Cancer. So you said, well, but how come it wasn't like that before? Because it, things weren't like that before. 
I mean, we, we didn't do the things we used to do before. We didn't have all the toxicities. We didn't have that. Now we do. Now nothing's regulated like it used to be, and everything's toxic for us. They didn't put tons of chlorine.